I'm about to share with you what I believe to be some of the most exciting prophecies being fulfilled in the Holy Land, but specifically in the nation of Israel. Now, I want to I want to preface what I'm about to say by sharing with you a couple stories that relate to what I'd like to share with you. Many years ago in the 1980s, I'm going to put it about 1985, I came to Israel for the very first time with a friend of mine named Pastor Floyd Lahan. He called me and he said, you need to go to Israel as much as you love the Bible. Go to the Holy Land, go to Jordan, you know. And, and I said, why do I want to go see a bunch of rocks? That was my answer. <laughs> I have now been here 36 times <laughs> because you cannot imagine your understanding of Scripture that just jumps up and becomes alive when you come here and see it firsthand and not just hear about it. And I remember my very dear friend Gideon Shore, who's been my tour guide from the very beginning. He was very knowledgeable in the Bible. I was, I was, I was very amazed how much he knew about the Old and New Testament together. And so we were in two places that year that I have never forgot. We were in what's called the Golan Heights. And it's the uh, old uh, ancient name is the, Bash ba the area of Bashan. And he began to show me the griffin vultures that were there. And he talked about how that they were m multiplying and populating. And there were a lot of parks that had them. And then it clicked with me that this was the area of the war of Gog of Magog. One of the areas, I should say. And in that passage of Ezekiel, it talks about ravenous birds. And that word ravenous is flesh-eating birds that would actually eat the flesh of men after the battle. And I thought, whoa. Well, that's interesting because these are these three types of birds that were populating and nesting there were ravenous birds. And I later found out that they're in Syria, they're in Lebanon, and there's a bird migration that happens twice a year of which there are tens of thousands of these birds that migrate in what's called the Syria-African Rift, and that's what we're in right now. And they go all the way up into that part of Israel, into Lebanon and Syria. And I think, okay, now that's interesting because when the prophet talked about the battle, he talked about the birds. But then we end up in the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, and we end up uh, right at the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, Gideon, my guide, again said, he said, do you believe the Bible? I said, well, of course I'm a minister. I believe the Bible. He said, but do you believe it literally what it says? And I said, yes, I do. He said, well, I'm going to tell you something interesting. He said, I want you to look back this way on the Mount of Olives. And on the Mount of Olives, there was an area where you didn't see any buildings. And I thought it was a little odd because, you know, they, they, that would be the premier place to build. Years ago, an American hotel chain, and I won't name it because they may not want me to tell this, but the American hotel chain wanted to build a major hotel on the Mount of Olives overlooking where when you'd get up, you could see the Temple Mount, all right? When they did the test, and my guide's brother-in-law, and I, I, I won't name him because I don't have his permission to use his name, so I don't want to name him, but he lives in uh, Tel Aviv. What, uh, what has a PhD from Berkeley University, and he had studied the earthquake fault lines in Israel. Believe it or not, and you can believe it because I have a map to show it, the Mount of Olives has a major fault line running through it. And they would not let them build because they were afraid of an earthquake happening and taking the hotel down one day. Now, why is that important? In the book of Zechariah, the prophet had a vision of the Messiah returning. And he didn't call him Jesus. He just says, the Lord in that day, his feet shall step on the Mount of Olives, which is eastward in Jerusalem, and the mountain shall cleave in two parts, one part to the east, one part to the west. And it will create a valley. And then it says, and this is important, you hear this, water would come from Jerusalem and part of it would go into the former sea and part of it go into the hinder sea. Now that makes no sense to you on the former and the hinder till you take a map out and you've been here. Jerusalem is situated in this direction way up on these mountains. We are 1,300 feet below sea level right now and Jerusalem is 2,500 feet in elevation. So Jerusalem sits up and the Dead Sea is the lowest spot on earth and it's sitting down like this. Now what happens is this, there has to be water somewhere under Jerusalem that's so huge and so massive. Number two, there has to be water, and I'll get to the prophecy in a moment because it all ties together, but there has to be a massive amount of water somewhere down here because the prophecy of Ezekiel is that the Dead Sea, which is 30% salt, chemicals, and minerals, will one day be healed and produce fish. Now that sounds impossible, I know. So it's gonna take a massive amount of water. So here's what, here's what we did. 
Robert Vandermont, who's standing beside me, who's the head of Noseworthy Travel, we began to research from people we knew about, is there water in Jerusalem? And the answer is absolutely yes. There is a massive amount of water under Jerusalem. And I, went, I remember sitting with Rabbi Yehuda Getz in the 1990s, I, I bless his memories, he was a wonderful man, in his office right above the Western Wall, and we were asking him about the prophecies about the water f coming from Jerusalem healing the seas. And he said, somewhere a few miles from here, and he pointed to the direction, there is an underground water source that's massive. Remember that, Robert? I'm pointing, looking at Robert, by the way, if you want to know who I'm looking at. And he said, this water has been discovered under the Temple Mount. And uh, we actually went one day, in fact, when we were researching this in the 90s, we went to a, a real, uh, very kind Arab Palestinian family that lived on the Mount of Olives who, uh, and I'm going, I'm going to be very careful here, but they have the keys to a church, and he said, if you want to see this water, and we weren't telling him about the prophecy, we were just saying we were interested in the water, he said, I can show it to you. So we went into a church, and I never have forgot this, we won't ever tell you what the church, where the church is, and we go underground, and there's these Roman pots that are that big from the Roman time that are underground in this church. We, we step a distance and all of a sudden I see water that's three feet deep in these cisterns. I said, this is rainwater. He says, no, it's not. We drain this water out of these cisterns and it suddenly reappears within a day. And he says, there is a source of water that we don't even know bubbling up from underground. Many years ago, there was some difficulties um, uh, under the Temple Mount and they were afraid that the, you know, this is kind of the conspiracy theories that Jewish people were, were pouring water in to try to undermine the dome, which is not true, by the way. So that water is there and the earthquake fault line is there. And here's where it gets even more intriguing. Right where we're at right here and in this direction over here. In fact, it's a little bit more in this direction. There is between the Judean mountains. And I want you to look with me right now. I want you to look right where I'm pointing. And I want you to see that cave. Do you see that cave? Okay. Do you see how that between the mountains, it's a little bit kind of a grayish color. When it rains in Jerusalem, that water pours down here and causes flash flooding. We have been here, this is very rare, but we have been here when all the water, because Jerusalem is 2,500 feet in elevation, pours from Jerusalem down the mountains and comes into these areas and it can absolutely, and that's why you have to be careful when it's raining, you get a flash flood that washes a bus away. Now, I don't know that's ever happened here. It has happened in the country of Jordan. And the other day before we got here, I don't know if you ever saw this. This is the craziest thing I've ever seen. It had rained near uh, En Gedi, I guess. Yeah. You know, and there's a huge Dead Sea resort down there. And the guys are standing there watching because they know what's happening. The water is washing over and the road just collapsed. Here and here, bam, the road collapsed. Now, they're so smart over here, they know it can happen. They had it repaired in 48 hours because there's thousands of tourists here. Nobody's hurt, but that's the power of the rain that comes from Jerusalem. Now, here's the point. Robert sent me the article several years ago. Now, all this ties into prophecy. That's why I don't want you to understand. He sent me the article several years ago that in this area underground, are y'all ready for this, is an underground lake of fresh water. And some of this was here during creation. And some of it is storage of water that just pours into here. And there is so much water underground that if it would split, now don't miss this, and go into the Dead Sea, it would change the chemical level of the Dead Sea to the point. I'm talking about if all of it flowed, right? Am I right, Robert? Because they've studied this. You could actually put fish in the Dead Sea and they would live. Now, the reason I'm talking about water here and the reason I'm talking about fish here, and I'm going to have Robert to give me his phone. I used to say, open your Bible. Now it's, give me your phone. <laughs> I'll get that in a minute. Your Bibles are now on your phone. I'm going to read to you Isaiah chapter 35. And we, if you were to go from where I'm standing right now and you were to go in this direction and just go straight, you're going to come to this spot that I'm about to tell you about. This is a prophecy that is over 2,600 years old. And 
I'm going to read it to you. The wilderness and the and the dry land shall be glad. And this is a different. This is the ASV version. I usually do the King James Robert, just so you'll know. The, <laughs> but this this is okay because this will make it plain to you. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It'll blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, and the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of Jehovah, the excellency of our God. Strengthen you the weak hands. Confirm the feeble knees, say to them that are fearful heart, be strong, fear not, behold, the Lord your God will come with vengeance, with recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Now this will be in the millennium. You understand when Jesus comes back to rule, the lame man will leap as a harp, the tongue of the dung shall sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert and the, gl and the glowing sand shall become a pool and thirsty ground, the springs of water, the habitation of jackals, they shall lay, there shall be grass and reeds and rushes, a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness, no one think, clean, thing shall pass over it. And I could keep reading here, but I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna go back to this. Now, I asked uh, one time about the wilderness blossoming like a rose. Now, when Mark Twain, and you know, that's a long time ago, took a train and came to Palestine, he said it was the most God-forsaken place he ever saw in his life. He said, I don't even know how you can call it a holy land or a blessed land because it's ugly and nobody inhabits it. And it was nothing but desert. Now, what happened was many years ago, a U.S. satellite found something underground in a place called the Aravau Rift. In Isaiah 35, in the King James, it says, The wilderness and the solitary place for, shall be glad for them, and the desert shall blossom like a rose. The word desert is arava. It's a specific place. There are seven Hebrew words that can be used for desert, and this one is a specific place. It is this rift that we're in right now, but it specifically is at the bottom of the Dead Sea, which is in this direction, and it goes 120 miles to the Gulf of Aqaba. It's all Israel. It's eight miles wide between mountains to 20 miles wide between mountains. See, we got the Judean wilderness here, the mountains of Edom and Moab there. And so we got a good, we got a good distance here, but down there it narrows. You're still tracking with me, right? Okay. Let's try that again. You're still tracking with me, right? Okay. Now, let, oh, go back to that because it cut, cut off and I want to read those verses. So the Aruval will blossom like a rose. When Israel became a nation in 48, the military guy said in that area we hated it because it was nothing but rock and sand. There was nothing there. So the U.S. tells Israel, go drill down there. It could be oil. It wasn't. It was water. And it was water that was put there when God created the heavens and the earth. Now that's what they said. It, was the, it goes back to the beginning of creation. All right. This... They then sunk a shaft and that water was right underground, 1,500 feet, and water just started exploding out. There's a pool. Now, Isaiah says there's going to be a pool of water there. And Isaiah says there's going to be grass, reeds, and rushes. Charlie will show you pictures of the actual spot where there's grass that looks like a golf course, reeds all over the place, rushes growing all over the place. Yeah, it's called Sapphire Park. And they take the water underground and have made the desert blossom like a, everything here's fulfilled is what I'm trying to tell you. And they've made it blossom like a rose. And the, my last count was 54 farms in that area. Now, now look, we've got pictures of this. Now we, we would go all the way down there, but it's way too far to go, okay? But here's the point. The tomatoes plants are so high, they produce 30% more tomatoes than any tomato plant in America. The cows give more milk than all the cows in America. The, they, they, can, they can have two harvest times a year because they do a, a drip irrigation system with the water that's underground. And in winter, when it's winter in Europe, the food that goes to Europe, a lot of it comes out of here. Now you're ready for this. The glory of Carmel, this is the prophecy. This is a phone actually, but the prophecy is right here. The glory of Carmel, Isaiah 35, will be given unto it. The company that ships out the food one of the names is the Carmel Packing Company. Oh. <laughs> it sends out food to Europe and the United States. Okay? And then the thing that, there's other parts of this that's real interesting, and I want you to go to Ezekiel 47 next. The, one of the things that's interesting is when you read that, it says there will be a highway there, 
and you know no unclean thing will pass and they have built a highway that runs from the, uh, from actually where we're at now all the way to the Gulf of Aqaba all the way into Egypt now the reason and I want you to understand the prophetic reasoning for Isaiah 35 verses 1 through about 8 being fulfilled is this because in the millennial reign all nations, according to Zechariah 14, will come to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. You will have to have an abundant supply of water and food. Would you agree? Yes. For a caravan of people to come. So the, where this is located, there will be farms with food all the way from that area, eventually. All the way from that area into this area, all the way up to the city of Jerusalem. So it's not just about now, it's about what's going to happen in the future. Now, in Ezekiel 47, he describes the temple that's about to be built one day, not, not anytime soon, but the third temple, the major temple that will be built by the Messiah when the Messiah Christ returns to Jerusalem. And Ezekiel 47 uh, gives you some of the detail. Actually, 45, 46, 47 tells you the rooms, the chambers, all those type of things. In fact, we have a gentleman that spent 14 years studying this. And uh, he's a, a, great, a great man of God. And he's allowed ISO to take all his drawings and show them one day at our school of the whole Millennial Temple. And you can take a virtual tour through every chamber. It is absolutely incredible uh, how big this temple is going to be one day, one day. Now, the prophet says, I, I saw water coming from under the threshold of the temple, of the, of, of the throne. And it starts out, you know the story, ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, and then what does it do? It becomes a river so big you can't swim in. Now that's not a metaphor. That's literal. So that is the water we talked about a moment ago that's already in Jerusalem that will one day happen when the Mount of Olives splits. So it's there. Then he starts saying to you, and this is the part that is really fascinating, that it becomes a river. And then he says this, Son of man, what have you seen? Then he brought me, caused me to return to the bank of the river. And when I, when I had returned upon the bank of the river were many trees on one side and on the other side. And he says, These waters issue forth toward the eastern region and shall go down into the Arava. You got the translation right there. That's pretty cool. It's a good translation. That is a good translation. I take my words back. I take my words back. There it is. So that's what we talked about. It says, it says desert, but that's the right word, Arava. And they shall go toward the sea and into the sea the waters were, uh, which were made to issue forth, the waters will be healed. That's the Dead Sea. It's not healed yet. There are no fish there. Okay? <laughs> I got to tell you something funny. That when I was in Jordan years ago, uh, a one of my guides had a t-shirt on said Dead Sea Fishing Club. And I thought, well, that's odd. And then in the back of it said the unhappy hooker. <laughs> okay, maybe that was not a good joke to tell right now in the middle of all this teaching. Okay, it, say, it says that the waters will be healed, there'll be a great multitude of fish, and it'll come to pass that fishermen shall stand from En Gedi. Now, En Gedi, we didn't go there today, but En Gedi is in this direction, and it has water, it has a waterfall, it has a great water source there, and there'll be fish of many kinds, exceedingly great. But the miry places at the Dead Sea and the marshes will not be healed, they'll be given to salt, okay? Now, let's just break this down, because only about three and a half, two and a half minutes left. What happens in this prophecy is the Dead Sea has to form two seas. The only way it can do it is if part of it dries up. Half of it's got, if you go south of here, we can document it, you can see it. There's a whole area where the Dead Sea has dried up and there's a canal that connects the two. This side looks like this. It looks like, it looks like normal water, but no fish are there. The southern part is so salty because it says it would be given to salt and not be healed that the salt is that thick. Okay, so it has now formed the two seas that the prophet, so the prophet's prophecy could be fulfilled. The water is underground that when the earthquake happens, will rush into here to heal it. And in Gedi has fresh water springs already, so there will be fishermen catch fish. Here's the part that's really amazing. And we documented this very first in the United States. People are talking about it. It's on World Net Daily. You know, people are writing books about it. It's amazing. You, I preach something and never get the credit for preaching it. And 10 years later, somebody writes a book and gets famous with it. You know, I mean, it's really true. It's funny. We've laughed about it. No big deal. We laughed. Somebody's got to, somebody's got to do it. Okay. But anyway, what has happened is there are pools of water opening up all along here. And you can see some of them right back here, pools of water. What happens is birds have come and, and, and anyway, done their business there, you might say, and there are fish eggs. In